So I just woke up. It's like two or three o'clock in the morning. Uh, I just received this text from this person. I don't know who they are, but they want to send me to LA. So here's the email slash text. Here's what it said. Um, I've been watching your YouTube channel and I have become as intrigued as you with not only the mystery behind Credit Pool, but more conceptually, the mystery behind how the grunge scene exploded into Seattle. What precipitated it? What set the stage for this electrifying short period of genius? I think the answer lies in the West Coast punk and hardcore scene that had been brewing in Seattle throughout the 80s and the dichotomy that existed between that and the rock scene of the Sunset Strip during that time. There's more. I want to send you on a mission to find those answers and connect the threads that lead straight to Seattle's magic. I've got some special guests I'll set you up with. Just get the answers. Find the true genesis of grunge. I'm going to L.A. <laughs> I'm going to retrace the roots of the Seattle grunge, American hardcore, and the Sunset Strip. I got to pack my bags. I don't know who this person is. Uh, he's sending me a plane ticket. I'm going to be in L.A. in a couple of hours. I'll see you there. Los Angeles, California. Specifically, we're in the heart of Hollywood. Walk of Fame here on Hollywood Boulevard. So here we have the W Hotel. What's the connection with me here right now at the W Hotel? Well, before I left Vancouver, I received an envelope. The envelope had no information. I don't know who sent it to me. Inside the envelope was a plane ticket for Los Angeles. It instructed me that I have 72 hours to go to Los Angeles, and it detailed what I need to accomplish while I'm here. He's paying for my hotels, I'm assuming it's a he, and he's covering all my expenses if I can cross every item off the list on the letter as instructed. So my first stop is to go into the W Hotel, receive another envelope that's gonna tell me where I'm gonna go. All of these envelopes that I'm gonna pick up from various locations are gonna be clues and I need to solve the mystery. He believes, my mysterious benefactor that is, who I think is possible. Somebody with money, somebody probably from Seattle who's very interested in the story of Credit Pool, but more so, really interested in me telling the true story of American hardcore and the Seattle scene in the late 80s and early 90s. So that's pretty well lit. That's about all the information I can give you right now. I'm gonna go inside, I'm gonna get the envelope. Let's go, let's do this. All right, here we go. Here's the envelope. This is gonna have the clues for the next series of interviews and whatnot that we're gonna do, all the locations, the bands. I can't wait to open it. Let's see what happens.
All right, so this is super exciting. So I just picked up the envelope at the uh, W Hotel in Hollywood. And my first assignment is to go and meet John Kastner in Hollywood. He's played with bands like the Asexuals, All Systems Go, and the Doughboys. He's toured for years, and uh, he's really connected in the LA scene. He knows just about everybody. And uh, he's gonna open up for us and give us all kinds of really cool information and stories about stuff he's done. And uh, we're gonna be there soon, because there we go, we just rolled by the rainbow. All right, so see you in a minute, John. So, John. Yeah. How the hell are you doing, buddy? Good. <laughs> so nice to see you. I mean, yeah, it's been a long time. You've worked with almost every single band or, you know, yeah. person that's out there in the music business over, yeah. over the span of your career. What are some of the highlights? I mean, you know, the highlights are measured differently for different people, right? I mean, yeah. for me, selling out the Spectrum in Montreal, that was a big deal for me, you know? Um, was that with the Doughboys? Yeah. We did have a bit of a riot at the show where I, some bouncer punched a little girl in the face and I jumped on his head. Um, it was a scene, but it was great. And then um, playing the old forum in Montreal. You know, I played the old forum opening for Rush. Um, it was at uh, a time when the Doughboys had really taken off. That's a, that's a different billing. How did you get on a Rush show? You know, at that time we were, we were Fucking the radio band, right? And so we... I mean, you guys were all over MTV, for example, yeah, and, and Much uh, Music, right? Yeah. And then, you know, we did a bunch of dates with Pearl Jam on that Pearl Jam 10 record. You know, Verdun Auditorium and... like That was a big arenas. tour. Yeah. The thing I find fascinating about the, the L.A. hardcore scene was that it was the first... Like, it was a skate scene, right? Yeah. Like, that's where that whole... Like, when people think about hardcore, they really yeah. think about the LA scene, even yeah. even though there's a significant East Coast scene. Well, the, the quality, I think, spoke to us. As you know, when we started out, um, it was like in Montreal, it was all about the British scene. All about it. Right? Mohawks, it was all about, the, like, it was about GBH and Discharge, Discharge and the, the Exploited. Was he Exploited or GBH when, I think it was the Exploited, he had his giant mohawk and we all stood there with glasses of water and he walked on stage and everybody threw water on him to try and get his mohawk to go down. Did it go down? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was pissed. I remember because it was like this kid had moved to him California when I was in grade seven and he, I traded him, um, I think it was the UK subs, I traded him three records. I remember I got Black Flag damaged, the first Circle Jerks group sex and the germs. And he traded me, it was for, I gave him three British punk rock records. Yeah. And that's how I heard about the very first um, LA punk rock stuff, you know? The, the L.A. thing that I was fascinated with was it was really an explosion Yeah. because it was like weekly. A new yeah. band, a new band, yeah. a new band, right? It was fresh. It was, it, was, it was a hotbed. You're right. It, it was, was fresh, fresh for us. New because, and exciting. You know, we had, we'd already gone through all the British stuff and we'd all, it, you know, the U.K. subs and it had all come to Montreal once or twice. Um, and then there was this cool... You know, and the New York scene kind of felt like a, a, almost closer to the British punk rock. It was hard and still this heavy fresh, and like, Yeah, exactly. And there's this fresh, light, fast L.A., like the Circle Jerks and all that stuff. It was just like, what the fuck is this? I guess that grunge definitely took 
a lot of influences from all yeah. different oh, corners yeah. of the musical spectrum, whereas 100%. most other genres didn't take so much influence from all the surrounding genres. Yeah. It was like, you know, here's a punk band or yeah. here's, you know, a, yeah. you know, a hardcore band. But it well, was yeah. like a, a mutation. Because all the people that were in that grunge team, like we all grew up listening to Kiss and then all merged into punk rock. Everybody was roughly the same age. And we all went through that same process of like loving 70s rock into punk, into hardcore. You know, some people kind of got a little bit more into like that you know, went from Motorhead then into Slayer, got into the heavier stuff. But we all kind of had that same thing, that same, uh, you know, core. And it was kind of where metal, punk, everything kind of melded into one that became that grunge scene. So I just got a text. It says, go to the Guitar Center on Sunset. The Guitar Center is definitely the most iconic music store in the world. I mean, more rock stars and musicians have purchased musical equipment from that store than any other place on the planet. We're also gonna meet up with a guy named Eric Lars, who's apparently the biggest Van Halen fan in the world. What does that look like to be the biggest Van Halen fan? And then I'm gonna go for a nice cold beer at the Sunset Grill right next door. Eric, hi Mike, how you nice doing? Nice to meet you. Van Halen's been a huge part of my life, kind of the soundtrack to my teenage years. And uh, you know, the death of Eddie is a famous person that passed that definitely you felt. Do you think there's any, do you think there's anything in common between the, the glam and metal scene and say the grunge scene? Do you think those bands shared any similarities or influences or do you consider them two completely different genres that are not connected in any way? I consider them completely separate genres and unfortunately as much as I really love grunge, it really kind of killed that whole glam scene, that rock scene, those bands just kind of fell by the wayside because grunge took over the world. I mean, a lot of people refer to the day that Nevermind came out, right? Like, the, the day Nevermind was released by Nirvana in 1991, it pretty well just decimated the hard rock genre. For sure. And I heard uh, on a podcast, I think it was Chad Smith, the drummer for the Chili Peppers, a guy had asked him, you know, is there a moment where you realize like this grunge thing or this this scene was really erupting? And he had said he was standing on the side stage at that New Year's Eve show at Cow Palace, and it was either with his brother or brother-in-law, I can't remember, and they broke into Smells Like Teen Spirit and the Cow Palace erupted. And Chad said that he saw that and looked at him and went, dude, the music scene has just changed 100%. It will never be the same again. He's like, that moment really resonated with him. Well, there's another confirmation that the day Nirvana broke was the day that hair metal died. Speaking of dying, I just got my next assignment. We're headed to the Hollywood Forever Cemetery to pay our respects to some of the greatest entertainers of all time. This could be kind of sad, and I'm, I'm hoping that I'm not going to cry on camera because... Uh, it's kind of emotional, you know, some of my favorite artists are buried there and it could be really somber. So here we are, we are in Hollywood. This is where everything fake emanates from. This is the Dream Factory, the Hollywood Studios. They sell the American Dream and any prepackaged dream they want. Your fantasy comes true in Hollywood. Everything about this place is fake. It's unbelievable. I mean, look at the grass. Even the grass is fake. The grass is always greener where the dogs are shitting. Some things are still real on the street of dreams.
what can you say about Johnny? I mean, a lot of people always try to figure out who was the original punk band. Was it Iggy Pop? Was it the Ramones? Was it the Saints and Radio Birdman from Australia? You know, or was it the 101ers with Joe Strummer? Like, we don't really know. I'm sure they all sort of started in different parts of the world at the same time, which is incredible because none of them were connected in any way. So it all just sort of spontaneously and organically formed around the time period due to the political climate and exactly where the world was at culturally. All we can do really is, is admire and, and appreciate the music that Johnny brought to the world. And I think the Ramones are probably the most influential punk band of all time. And they also had a huge influence on the American hardcore scene. With, without Johnny Ramone, there definitely wouldn't have been an American hardcore scene because the Ramones were at the forefront of all things punk. Legendary Seattle grunge rocker Chris Cornell has died. Cornell was the front man for Soundgarden. CBS 2's Craig Herrera is live this morning with the details. Craig? Hey there, Sharon and Jeff. Yeah, it's such a sad story and such an incredible career. He's one of those guys, along with Soundgarden, that really led that grunge movement back in the 1990s. You think about him, you think about Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. Oh yeah, you remember one of their big hits, Fell on Black Days. I'm a little bit somber, I'm a little bit shook up, to be honest. This is hard for me. I was kind of cool rolling in here, and then when I got close to Chris's grave and, you know, I saw his memorial here, I, I got all choked up because Chris Cornell was not just a rock star. He wasn't just another grunge musician. Just like it says on his headstone there, it says, voice of our generation, an artist for all time. I mean, that pretty well sums it up. You don't really need to say more than that about Chris Cornell. So much tragedy has befallen the soldiers of grunge from Seattle. It's just, it's, it's terrible. But this is a great tribute to Chris Cornell. We're here to pay our tribute and to mourn the loss of a voice of a generation. Downtown Los Angeles, AKA DTLA. So this was the Mecca, the metropolis of Los Angeles back in the day. The whole street lined with theaters. But that ended up drying up at some point either in the late 50s or the early 60s when everybody started to move to the suburbs. So this was a ghost town. They would roll up the carpet and the sidewalks at night and you wouldn't even come down here. No one would venture into downtown LA. There was no need to. A lot of the people that, you know, ended up doing better and could afford homes, they, they all moved to Southern California. They had kids, you know. By the time we reached the 80s, the early 80s, these kids were now teenagers and they needed a place to go. They needed something to do. So they got skateboards. And that was the thing in Southern California. You, know, you got a skateboard. Some of these kids that had skateboards decided to also play guitar. And out of that combination of guitar and skateboard was born the American hardcore scene. Southern California teenage kids. 
They started playing in bands and needed places to play. They couldn't play the Sunset Strip because that was that was reserved only for, you know, metal and glam and bands like that. And if you didn't fit the formula, you weren't going to get to play, you know, the mecca of Hollywood, which is where you needed to go to make it. So the bands had to find an alternative place to play. So they found downtown Los Angeles, which was essentially derelict and abandoned. It's absolute tragedy at its worst. This is probably the lowest point of society in North America that I'm aware of. But there was plenty of venues like Madame Wong's and other places that were willing to book the punks. All kinds of warehouse spaces and things where they could play. It was basically punk rock city in the seedy, dingy downtown core of Los Angeles. Every punk rocker's dream. What could be more punk rock than going to a Dead Kennedys concert when you're 17 and stage diving and breaking your arm? I mean, basically, it was the greatest day of my life. So for my next assignment, we're gonna go and meet Rebecca Severin, who's a musician, a guitar player, a seamstress for Kiss. And she wants to meet up at Headline Records, which is the temple and congress of punk. Every city seems to have one of these places where all the punks congregate and do all things punk rock and get together and network. I hope I can find something I'm missing in my collection. None of these bands that we see on the wall and you know in all the record bins, none of these bands made any money. But here's the crazy thing. Nowadays, if you could have remained as a band, stayed active and continued to play, those bands now make money. Like the Circle Jerks. I right? know, I was gonna say that. I remember when Keith Morris got sick, he didn't have medical insurance and he was crowdsourced and to pay for his surgery. He goes, I gave you the best years of my life, now give me back something. I was like, you know what, we all suck right now. We have nothing for you. I was hanging, traveling in real, like, kind of low paying circles. Yeah, no paying. Yeah, no, no paying. paying circles. I love all these obscure records. I could just look through these all day long. I wonder if they have my band genetic control in here. That would be hysterical. Could you imagine that? So look at some of these bands. Hell Crusher, Final Conflict. Oh, this is a good one over here. Skull Control. Like, okay. Like, have, have you heard of all of these bands? I haven't. Where are all these obscure bands now? I mean, MIA. Everybody's MIA. And, and then I auditioned for this band, Feline, and they were like early wannabe Guns N' Roses female style. And I call, and the singer's like, What color's your hair? <laughs> no. And I go, It's white. I want to be the only blonde in the band. Will you dye it red or black? And I said, No. What color is your guitar? And I go, it's zebra wood. She's like, what zebra wood? And I go, it's really beautiful, rare, exotic wood. I built this. I used to make guitars. It has light and dark streaks. Were you painted red or black? And I'm like, no. And she goes, one more question. <laughs> and I go, what? And she says, do you have a big butt? <laughs> and I was like, why don't I just come over and sit on you? Talk about taking the cliché into the mainstream. Absolutely brilliant. The Sunset Strip, long before rock and roll, was orange groves, farmland, and country living. A stark contrast compared to today. It's completely unrecognizable. You wouldn't even know it.
Wow, this is incredible. I mean, just being on this iconic strip is mind-blowing. This is and always has been, since it was invented, the entertainment mecca of the world. These venues, these hotels, these places were sanctuaries. You had your private meetings here. This is where you signed all of your contracts. This was the pre-internet social networking mecca. This is where it all happened. There's nothing better than driving down the strip and reliving all this history and imagining all these famous people and what they were doing. We're gonna go and meet Todd Kearns for my next assignment. He's playing with Steven Adler tonight. They're gonna be playing all the hits of Guns N' Roses. I can't wait to hook up with them at the Rainbow. This is where they're gonna reinvent the magic. It's gonna be so epic. Let's do the time warp again. That's right, kiddies. Set the time machine for 1984. We're going to relive our youth with Steven Adler, the man, the myth, the legend from Guns N' Roses. So were you guys, like, part of the metal scene back in the day? Would you guys have hung out on the strip and come and seen these bands? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And did you think the Dickies and having like that band and the Dickies on the same bill, do you think it worked or was I it I love clear? it. I wish they would do more. I wish they would do more. Yeah. But I, I, I think, I think punk rock and hard rock should go got, together. Got back it. in the day, punk yes. rock and, and metal didn't go together, did it? No, no it didn't. They were rivals because there were right. hair bands. Back, back in the day on the strip, it was one or the other. And, and metal and, and the glam bands ruled the Sunset Strip, right? But, but, we, but we love punk, though. Like Back in the day, I, I would say, fuck the, the metal and the glam bands, because most of them really kind of did suck. So you're playing up there tonight, it's thriving, it's pumping. All, yes. all the people there, clearly, at least a majority of them, were all here in the 80s. Yes, that's true, that's true. Yeah. How does it compare playing to you know this crowd like 30 five odd years later. It's very similar, oddly enough. It's like, I think that same energy. It's like these people that loved rock and roll back then still love rock and roll. So they're here like, you know, celebrating that all these years later. I think it's 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 fresh. It feels new at, at classic at the same time. You know what I, mean? I mean, we talked to a couple of other people who were coming out of the show and I asked them, you know, how did you find the Dickies? How did they fit? And they were like, it was perfect. I thought so. I thought so. Because back in the day, that wouldn't have happened. No, not not so much. No. It was bring up an interesting point because we're waiting. We, I've se seen things kind of spin back, but I haven't seen it spin back in a very huge way yet. But who knows? I mean, the, the record industry as it is is, is such a, a head scratcher. So I don't know what to make of it. I mean, I think punk has come around. Oh yeah. Because we definitely have a new punk, right? Yep. Like that's you know, yeah. and and I mean, Green Day and the Offspring and those bands, they were the beginning of it. But punk is still going. Yeah. The Warp Tour and the Lollapalooza. Oh, absolutely. I mean, all yeah. that stuff is is, is very much alive. You go to their shows, and the very pH balance of the room feels like 1986. It's the weirdest thing. People behave like it's 1986, but they outside of that context, they're. 21st century people and they walk into that room and it's immediately the 80s. It's the weirdest thing. That's right, there's no place like home. No place like the Sunset Strip. Just close your eyes and this tribute band sounds like the real thing. Guns and Roses. Go down the street and it's quiet riot. This is 1984. I must have clicked my heels together. It is a time warp. So here we are, we're in Los Angeles, uh, Hollywood, Hollywood, California, at this swanky boutique hotel. I'm a little, I'm a little thirsty, I'm a little parched, and I'd like to get something to drink. And I've noticed that most hotels I go to, they usually have like a bottle of water, here, or here somewhere, 
conveniently located. And I've been looking everywhere in this hotel room for water. There's none. I don't get it. Jackpot. Oh, here we are. Well, this looks rather pleasing and appealing. How much is that absolute vodka? Awesome, it's only $75. It's on special today. But wait, if you act now, not only do you get the, the absolute vodka, but you get the Valentine thong. Let's have a look and see what it looks like. Does this tickle your fancy? I need some headphones. Hey, only $145 for headphones. Oh, hang on, hang on. Bingo. The Temptation Lovers Kit. I'm almost tempted to buy it. I wonder what's in it. Okay, hang on. Here we go, guys. This is this is hot. So it contains the couple's vibrating ring, the mini multi-speed vibrator, and the two premium condoms. So you get twice the loving for the single price. And also liquid pleasures and personal lubricants. I'm sold. Sign me up. Put that on my bill, will you, Garcon? So here we are at the Troubadour Tavern on the border of Beverly Hills and Hollywood. This venue was iconic in the 60s and into the 70s. You know, this is where the Eagles, you know, got their start and so did Elton John. But just up the street a little bit on the Sunset Strip, you know, the Doors were playing up there. You know, the hippies were up there. You know, they had a whole scene happening. And what happened after that was, in the 80s, glam took over. It was all about instant gratification and total excess. But the strange thing was, down south in the beaches in California, it was all about hardcore. But the thing is, hardcore bands like the Circle Jerks and Black Flag, they weren't welcome on the Sunset Strip. You had to be a, a glam band, a hair metal band. And now the irony is, it's totally changed. Everything's different on the Sunset Strip. The doors are open to everybody. If you're a punk band, a hardcore band, you can come to the Sunset Strip and you can play, but back in the day, man, it was a divided place. It was a war zone, and you had to keep them separated. So I just got my next assignment, and uh, we're going to be driving. Going to meet with Richard Duguay. Richard Duguay uh, is quite well known as a guitar player. He's played in a lot of uh, well-known bands. Uh, one of the most significant bands that he's played in, and I'm a big fan of that band, was Personality Crisis from, um, from Winnipeg, Manitoba. They came out around the early to mid 80s and uh, they had this one album called Creatures for a while and it was extremely well received. Um, it was embraced by the American hardcore scene and it was embraced internationally as well. And he's been living down here in Los Angeles for a while. He's very familiar with uh, a lot of the bands, a lot of the scenes. He's played the Sunset Strip. He knows all the punk rock and hardcore guys. So he's a huge resource of information on uh, you know, getting information about the scene and the history and all that kind of stuff. So we're headed to his place now. And we're going to see what he's got to share with us. So let's do it. Hardcore punk rock, whatever you want to call it, the the California punk rock right. version. Right, late 70s. Late 70s no. into the early 80s is really when that no. that whole sound kind of exploded. It, it was it was, but I mean, I guess we should clarify a little because it was really a Southern California thing. It really wasn't 
an LA thing or a Hollywood thing. It really was more. It was more so down cow. the beaches. It was down skateboard south. kids yeah. picking up a guitar. They hear the Ramones and they're like, "Hey, I can play those three chords." Well, punk, and that punk rock really... came out of rock and roll. Correct. Okay, that, this is how I view it. It's like you know, the Pistols were the Who sped up. Correct. Et cetera, et cetera. And then when hardcore came up, it lost the role. Right. That's just how I view it, where it wasn't based in, in the old three-chord rock and roll thing. It was all about the aggression and the speed and the, the generally shouted lyrics. There was no melody. I mean, there was, but not... Not, not traditional, not, not, in traditional not like the 76, 77 punk rock bands. So it was, you know, every generation has to make their own thing. But what's interesting about, you know, the way the, the, the Sunset Strip worked and that, and that whole sort of scene is, you know, you have the, the hanger-ons, as they call them, and, you know, you've got... It, it's, it's a very glamorous fantasy for all those people who, who, who aren't in a band and haven't made it. Which goes back to even, like, the dolls at the Mercer's, Mercer Street Art, whatever it's called where you couldn't tell the audience from the band. Exactly. And which was, you know, originally a great thing, it, you know, but it, everything gets watered down. But what's interesting is during that same, same time period with Southern California, right, where the bands were, I don't know what the right term is. I don't know if it's honest or real or whatever it was, but they weren't chasing that dream. It wasn't about the glitz. It wasn't about the money. It wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, about a lot of that stuff. It's just they wanted to be true to themselves and true to their fans. Right. And, and that sort of dictated, you know, how they would navigate their careers, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't want to be hangers on. They wanted to, they wanted to earn the right. Yeah. And they, they wanted to make music, you know, on their own, own terms. Because the Ramones were considered punk rock when the Pistols came over, and it was like a circus. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, it was... And the Pistols gave them exactly what they wanted. It was wanted. a puppet show. But it also became... It killed the Ramones. It, it allowed the record companies and radio stations to go... See, that's punk rock. You know, Sid's cutting his chest and puking. Right. And there's no commercial appeal to it. So it took from 70, early 78, when the Pistols exploded, to 91 to get a band that they could... You know, grunge was a little bit of a combination of, you know, that American punk rock and hardcore... But it was also, there was some influences coming from, you know, the heavier side of some of the metal bands and, and the harder rock bands. Um, and then they, it, it's almost as though, you know, uh, you know, hard rock and punk had a baby, mm -hmm. and, you know. Yep. Yep. They called it grunge. 90 or 91, the strip from Crescent Heights all the way to Gazzari's, which was the, ba almost at Delaney, I think. Both sides of Sunset were packed with kids, flyering, partying, hanging out, networking. Like like metal kids like, and hard rock fuck, kids. It was like packed. In 91, 92, probably more 92, I remember going up, going to the Rainbow or something, and there was not a soul from... That scene. From that scene... There wasn't anybody there, period. But most of those people moved up to Seattle or the Pacific Northwest. Chasing the dream. Chasing that, the dream that Rock and all of a sudden they bought flannels and da-da-da-da-da and took their act up north. And I, you know, that's when I knew it was over. I didn't like it. I still don't like it. I never understood about singing about how up your life is when everybody knows their lives are up. I had a feeling that we would end up back here. We're in Hamosa Beach. This is where it all started. I mean, this is the hardcore source. So many bands started in this area, you know, skateboard kids, 
total aggro and aggressive, you know, just grinding out these power riffs at hyper, hyper speed. You know, this is the source. This is where it all began. I'm so pumped. Fletcher, Pennywise. I mean, what more can you say? It's a perfect day. Because we knew, we knew we were punk rockers. Like, that's real shit. Like, this is what the public's been waiting for. Real shit. Dudes in jeans and fucking t-shirts. No makeup on, no hairspray. Just fucking playing real shit. Singing real lyrics. Not singing about cocaine and girls. Well, probably they were a little bit, but in a different kind of way, right? <laughs> um, they were calling Nirvana grunge, which it was not. It was fucking punk rock. Right. They were always a punk band. All those bands that were, that were uh, you know, huge, that ran the Sunset Strip, that all got huge into arena bands, you know, uh, you know, they all ended up, you know, I think Great White was one of the first. They kind of, they started to, and we all know what happened when they hit the clubs, right? Yep. Not good. And I think all those bands were, were ready to cash in on the short vision because they knew, much like you had to lie to get in to play the Sunset Strip, those bands were playing the game. It's like, look, if we look this part yep. and we sing these lyrics and we play these three chords, we're in. And that's, that's how people get caught up. So like a band like Pennywise, we've been around, what, 30 years now or longer or something? I don't know, like Bad Religion, 40 years. Like, it's real shit and it's not going anywhere because it's real shit. And we weren't we weren't trying to emulate someone. We were just doing our own thing. Like you listen to like Fear or like Bad Religion, TSOL, like all those bands are punk rock bands, Circle Dicks, they all sound different. Black Flag, they all they all cut from the same cloth, but they all have like original. You put on fucking White Snake, Poison, Dawkin, any of those fucking bands, and you couldn't tell the difference of any of them, barely. No. Because they're all doing the exact same shit, and they all looked exactly the same. And what's, what's fascinating is it seems that, you know, the grunge movement was really a transition from the earlier American hardcore, right? Like when, when I know that lots of those bands, you know, whether it was Soundgarden or Nirvana or Pearl Jam, a lot of times in interviews they've referenced a lot of the Southern California hardcore bands as major influences. What amazes me is that it happened in California first with the hardcore and then it moved up to Seattle. Mm -hmm. You know, geographically it just went to a much darker place. I remember Jim going, this record's gonna be fucking huge. He's playing like um, Teen Spirit. I'm like, what do you mean huge? He's like, it's gonna sell fucking millions. I'm like, bullshit. It's just fucking good like punk rock, punk rock slash rock. And he's like, nope. Giant. I'm like, mm -mm. sure enough, I was fucking wrong on that one. Because I just couldn't <laughs> picture like the general public like eating that up, like you know, 40 million people or whatever. It's just it was ridiculous to think that way, but it happened. So musically, so there are sim some similarities. I mean, you know, between hard rock, uh, you know, metal, and you know, some of the other styles of uh, of some of the punk rock bands and the heavier punk rock bands is, you know, musically, if you take the lyrics away. We're talking distorted guitars, guys are using Mesa Boogies, you know, a big drum sound, all that kind of stuff. But the, the biggest thing that, that separates them is lyrics, right? It's like we were saying, that, that shallow, you know, meaningless sort of lyrical content that kids, you know, they want the truth about life. I want what's good. Right. I want the red wing boots and I want fucking bad religion. And I listen to these lyrics and they mean something and they're tattooed on my arm, and I'm taking this to the fucking grave, and then they're gonna play, you know, bro him at my funeral when I die. So, substance, man, and that's what the best things in life are made of. It's been 72 hours and I know why I'm here. Down at the beach, it all makes sense now. I've come back to the source that inspired the Seattle magic. 
What precipitated grunge can be traced back to the SoCal beaches and the Sunset Strip, weaving through the canyons like a carving knife, slicing through the caverns of my mind. My thoughts rambling as I try to stitch the sequence together and make sense of it. We have to accept the fact that we're all different. If this can happen musically, it can happen in a society, it can happen globally. We've reached a crescendo and face a summit of challenges. We have a chance to accept our differences and embrace our surroundings like punk and hard rock were able to converge into grunge. The power of music has the ability to bring people together. We're all world citizens, and if we work together, anything is possible. Yeah, and we have played with that band, that Credit Pool band, a few times. They were like kind of, they were like one of those grunge bands that seemed like they should have been bigger than they were. I don't know why they didn't take off and everybody else did. You know? Right here on the Sunset Strip, if you can't see this, is the legendary rock scene. Uh, next to the rainbow, the whiskey go goes down there. Kazaris used to be back there. This was the Sunset Strip. Well, it still is the Sunset Strip. But uh, I don't know if Credit Pool would, would have been a, They probably did some showcases. It's kind of a vague memory, but the singer, I forget his name. Silas. Silas called me and said, I got this outfit. I bent over and I ripped out the ass. Credit Pool was worse slash better than Flash Bastard. If, if anybody knows who Flash Bastard is, crazy. Right. Donald. You know, they were all crazy. I was just curious if, if you had ever come across them in your travels anywhere. Have you ever heard of them? Credit? Credit pool? Credit pool. 